In our previous section of this lecture, we were discussing the idea of who is God? Is it Jesus? Is it Buddha? Is it Brahma, Shiva? And we challenged God to tell us who he was and to prove to us that he is truly God. He gave us three solutions, prophecy, time prophecy, and statistics or science. Jesus Christ has shone through as the true God. And in contrast to the other gods, stands above them all and claims to be God and rightfully so because he's just proved himself to be so. He says in, in John 5, 39, he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. Now, Jesus is referring to the scriptures in this text. And he says, you're searching them because in them you think you have eternal life. But actually what you're reading is in testifying of me. Question. When Jesus was saying this, which scriptures would he have been referring to? The New Testament or the Old Testament? Well, as we know today, it would have been the Old Testament. It would have been the books that had been assembled, like the prophet Isaiah, which the eunuch was studying, like Daniel, etc., etc., which are all books that make up the Old Testament. Interesting to realize that Jesus here is pointing at the Old Testament and saying, but the Old Testament, as we know today, is actually speaking about me. Now, how does this all work? I've got two questions which I'd like to propose. Question one, did the people have the gospel as we know today, in the days before the cross. Question one. Did the people have the gospel of Jesus Christ as we know today in the days before the cross? Question two. Were the people in the Old Testament saved in a different way to what we are today? See, this is the basis of what we have to study about God being God. Because in Mag Malachi 3 verse 6, he says, For I am the Lord, I change not. So if Jesus is saying the Old Testament scriptures refer to me, and then he says in Malachi, but I don't change, then in the New Testament we need to wonder about, did the Old Testament people have a dis different gospel to what we have today? Let's look at the earthly tabernacle or the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a, a fantastic structure which was assembled upon specific instructions of God. Now when the Bible gives us some information and gives us added information to something that is already being described, the information in the Word, in Scripture, is not just there by the by. When the Bible gives us information, we have to stop, prick up our ears and take notice. And there are chapters upon chapters upon chapters in the Bible that describe how to set up the tabernacle on earth. I want to look at some interesting aspects of this. It's interesting to notice that in this tabernacle there was only one entrance. And it was an entrance on the east side. That's in the Old Testament. Today, when we look at Jesus Christ, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So in the same way the Old Testament sanctuary had one entrance, today, in the New Testament sanctuary, if you like, Jesus Christ, there's only one way towards the throne of God. As you walk through the entrance, the first thing that you encountered inside the tabernacle or inside the sanctuary was the pile of ashes. Now that's very interesting why that is there. Everything, let me just say this, everything within the temple had a reason for being there. And the pile of ashes were kept in view, and you'll see on the graphic that the front of that, underneath the, the altar, the brazen altar of, of burnt offering, underneath it, the front area was kept open. And the reason for that is so that people entering the temple could re recognize the end or the judgment of the wicked. And it would bring them to repentance. The psalmist, in David, when he was writing in Psalm 73, he, he is discussing this exact point. He says, I can't understand the prosperity of the wicked. It's the same as today. How can the evil people or the people that do not understand and know and live according to God, how can they be so prosperous? And then in Psalm 70, uh, 73 verse 17, he says, 
until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. You see, when you walk into the sanctuary through the one entrance, the first thing you see is the end of the wicked. In other words, the ashes. After that, you would come to the brazen altar of burnt offering where the innocent lamb of bearing the repentant sinner's sins would be offered. Another lovely fact or juicy tidbit just for interest sake is to realize that the lamb was killed by the sinner themselves. And this was to impress on that person the impact of their sin. You see, can you imagine taking a little lamb, tiny, beautiful little lamb, and having to cut its throat? That will get you thinking and it will make you realize, but that little thing did nothing to deserve that. He is dying on my behalf. After the brazen offer of burnt offering, you come to the laver, which is right in front of the sanctuary tent. And this sanctuary tent outside, you would have the laver, this dish. It was basically a dish with water in it. And this was where the priest would go to wash his hands and his feet before he went into the temple. Remember that every item in the sanctuary has got a specific requirement or a specific reason for being there. Once you've walked past the laver, you enter the sanctuary tent or what's known as the holy place. Inside the holy place, it was a quiet place, sheltered, and it was a place where the priest could come in a closer personal relationship with God. Inside there were some very specific items. Firstly was a table of showbread. Secondly, were the seven lamps, or the lamp with the seven, seven lampstands. And then thirdly, the altar of incense. These items were in the holy place. And then once you had gone past the holy place, there would be a thick curtain. They, they estimate the curtain was as high as six meters high and as thick as a man's hand. That's thick. That's a huge piece of material. Right? That's like a brick wall today. Thick as a brick wall, six meters high. The, the curtain that would separate the holy place from the most holy place. So if you were to go into the most holy place, inside was the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant itself had some very, very fascinating aspects. The first thing to notice would be inside the Ark of the Covenant, if you were to open it up and look inside, inside the Ark of the Covenant would be the pot of manna. The pot of manna represents God's ability to provide for our every need. You see, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all your worldly needs will be added unto you. He has the ability to provide. This comes from Israel when he provided the manna for the Israelites in the desert. So that's the first thing that we notice. Secondly, also inside the Ark of the Covenant is Aaron's rod. This is a, a dead walking stick which came to, came to life and in one night it budded, produced leaves and brought forth almonds. Now, this dead walking stick represents God's ability to take a, a sinner f who's going through repentance and bring out of death a sinner back to life. So firstly, he can provide for your needs and secondly, he can take you from death to life. Also inside the Ark of the Covenant in the center was the Ten Commandments. Exodus 25 verse 16 and 31 verse 18 explains to us about the Ten Commandments. And thou shalt put these into the Ark of the Testimony, which I shall give thee. And he gave unto Moses two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. These were items or, or, or laws, guidelines on how to live life which were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant and they were written in stone signifying the eternal type of, of attitude that these laws would have in our lives. So these Ten Commandments were written in stone and interestingly enough, they are the core principles of the throne room because directly above the Ten Commandments, you have the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Now the lid of the Ark of the Covenant was, was made of solid gold and it was called the mercy seat. We'll get to that now. Once the Ark of the Covenant had been closed, outside of the Ark of the Covenant was a little pocket with a, a scroll that had been written and was slid into the outside. This was the, called the ceremonial law. 
Deuteronomy 31 verses 24 to 26 explains that when Moses had made an end of writing the word of this law in a book, Moses commanded the Levites saying, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant that it may be there for a witness against thee. So there were two laws, one written by the finger of God on stone and placed inside the ark of the covenant. Another law written by Moses, by man, on a type of parchment skin or paper, rolled up and put outside the Ark of the Covenant in some sort of pocket. Right? That was called a ceremonial law. And those laws governed certain things about eating, certain things about festivals, what they called Sabbath days, and various other, other items which were strict instructions in those days. Now, above the Ark of the Covenant, you had the two angels. Now, those two angels are called covering cherubs. And these two angels actually represent the two angels in heaven that cover the throne of God in heaven. I always wonder at the, the idea of Lucifer or Satan being called the covering cherub. Because he was one of the two angels that covered the light of God in heaven, what's known as the Shekinah glory you see you got the ark of the covenant the mercy seat which was made of solid gold which is above the ten commandments and then covering that were the two uh, covering cherubs and in between is what's known as the shekinah glory now in the original writings the word for the shekinah glory is a word for light there is no light source it's just light and that is the very presence of God and in the holy of holies would be the Shekinah glory and were the high priest to enter into the holy of holies without having his sins cleansed before that he would immediately perish through the brightness of the presence of God now those were all items within the sanctuary and every single one had a representation or a meaning let's put this into context that's all in the old testament how does that refer to the New Testament. Well, like I showed you, the single entrance into the, the sanctuary of the tabernacle of God pointed towards Jesus Christ being the one way which we can attain salvation. John 14 verse 6 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Father but by me. Not by Allah, not by Buddha, not by anybody else, but by me. Right? What about the ashes? Well, the ashes in the Old Testament sanctuary points towards Jesus' judgment on the wicked in the end of time. What about the lamb, the burnt offering, the sacrifice of the lamb? Well, the sacrifice of the lamb in the Old Testament points towards Jesus' death on our behalf in the New Testament. What about the high priest in the Old Testament sanctuary? Well, the high priest represents Jesus himself. The brazen altar of burnt offering represents Jesus becoming the Passover lamb. What about the laver for washing in front of the sanctuary tent? The laver for washing represents baptism into Jesus Christ. Let's go to the holy place first. The holy place actually foretold the Christian life, which is a, Christ, is a, is a life centered around Jesus Christ, focus on Jesus Christ. There was no Christ-centered focus of life in the Old Testament because Christ hadn't come yet. But in the New Testament, exactly the same as in the Old Testament, each item foretold of absorbing the bread, being involved in taking out the light of Jesus Christ and prayer through to the Shekinah glory in heaven through the power of Jesus Christ. And then in the most holy place. Well, the holy place actually shows in the Old Testament the the power and the magnitude and the truthfulness of Jesus in the throne room of God. It's incredible to see that the Old Testament sanctuary, as this was displayed in Moses' time and throughout history, is exactly the same as the gospel we have today. I mean, that in itself is just mind-boggling. The Old Testament sanctuary represents the New Testament gospel. And the same gospel that we have in the Old Testament is the same gospel as we have in the New Testament. Except that one or two things have changed. We, don't, we no longer have to kill a lamb for our sacrifice because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. So, question. 
If the Old Testament gospel is exactly the same as the New Testament gospel, what changed when Jesus came? What changed? Something must have changed. Well, remember outside of the Ark of the Covenant, there was another law which was written by man called the ceremonial law. Well, that law fell away. Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 26 speaks of Moses writing that law. The Lord told Moses, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. This is when Moses had to write down these statutes and these laws, not put them inside the ark with the Ten Commandments, but put them outside the ark. And this all came to an end in Colossians 2, 14 to 17. It explains that Jesus' crucifixion was blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ." So this is the m most uh, well-known text used to explain that you are no longer out of the, under the law, that the law has been abolished because it's been nailed to the cross. But the question needs to be asked, which law was referred to in Colossians 2? Which law referred to meat? Was there any law in the moral law that referred to meat or to drink or to a holy day? Well, there is except that it didn't mention new moons or Sabbath days. You see, Sabbath days with a small s is, if you look in the New King James Version, it's not Sabbath day with a capital S, it's Sabbath days with a small s. Those are all the festivals and the, the wheat sheaf and the Passover, etc., etc. Those were called Sabbath days. Now, which law referred to a meat, drink, holy day, new moon, Sabbath days, etc.? Well, it was the ceremonial law. Question two, Colossians tells us that these are a shadow of things to come. So, question two. Where does the shadow stop? Imagine you're standing in your garden, the sun is busy going down, and you have a long shadow behind you. The shadow starts at your head on the other distance over there, and it comes and comes and comes. Where does the shadow stop? Boom, there where you are, right? Right? So these Sabbath laws, these new moon festivals, these various meat laws inside the, the ceremonial law were a shadow of whom nailed it to the cross? Jesus Christ. See, they stopped at the cross. And that's why when you look at the Jewish feasts in type and anti-type, you can see that one Jewish year actually represents an in, the entire Christian era. Let me explain this. Every Jewish year you would have various feasts. You would have the Passover feast, which would be on Nisan 14. And the Passover field was the type in the Old Testament of the anti-type in the New Testament. The Passover on Nisan 14 was fulfilled in the crucifixion. Now we know that happened on Friday. There's some contention about that, but we'll get into that now. Let's look at Exodus 12, 12 verse 3. Onwards all the way to 47. I'm just going to take excerpts from it. In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them a lamb without blemish, a male of the first year, and ye shall keep it up to the fourteenth day of the same month. So regarding the Passover lamb, on the tenth day, Nisan, 14, you, uh, Nisan 10, you would take a lamb without blemish, a male, and you would keep it in your home, in your household for four days. And ye shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. It is the Lord's Passover." Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh. You're not allowed to take any flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Does this sound familiar? 
We've just been through the prophecies about no bone shall be broken. Well, the Passover lamb, which was taken four days before Passover into the house, would be killed on Nisan 14. It is the Lord's Passover. You have to eat of the flesh. You have to take the blood and put it over the doorposts. And you're not allowed to break any bones. That's the type. The fulfillment of the anti-type is incredible. Four days before his death on the cross, the Sanhedrin met and they decided to condemn Jesus to death. Incredible. By their evil intentions, they had set Jesus aside at the same time as the Passover lamb was being set aside. So because the system, the sacrificial system, had not been done away with, the priest who was fulfilling his duties took the Passover lamb and put him inside on the same day that Jesus, by the Sanhedrin, had been condemned to death. On the ninth hour, according to Mark 15, verse 34 and 37, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. This is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Every year at Passover, the Passover lamb was offered at 3 p.m. And this ninth hour was 3 p.m. While the priests were preparing the Passover lamb in the sanctuary, Christ was being put to death outside on a cross. They were putting the true lamb of God to death, but they didn't even recognize their own prophecies because they were busy with the sanctuary lamb or with the Passover lamb. And type was about to meet anti-type. Just as with the Passover lamb, none of Jesus' bones were broken and he was pierced by a spear in the side. Just as the Passover lamb, none of its bones were broken and it was pierced with a skewer to put it on the roast. Phenomenal. It, the, the Passover type was fulfilled in the anti-type. It was a complete connection between the two. There was only four days. Some people say, well, Jesus, if you go according to the studies, you'll see that he was crucified on the Wednesday. Well, that's if you don't understand the idea of inclusive reckoning, which is the style of writing at the time where a day men mentioned in the word is actually inclusive of any part or portion of that day. And it, if he were crucified on the Wednesday, it wouldn't have been a full fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Type Passover had met Passover lamb had met anti-type in Jesus Christ. That was the one festival that they had, the one Sabbath day with a small s. What about unleavened bread, which was Nisan 15? This is the very next day, Nisan 15. This was fulfilled with Christ in the grave. What about first fruits, Nisan 16? The very next day, this was fulfilled through the resurrection. Every single one was a type meeting an anti-type. C16, which was the fourth festival, which was the Feast of Weeks, was fulfilled in Pentecost. This was the harvest of souls that was to take place. And just as the Old Testament festivals were a shadow of things to come in the New Testament, so the crucifixion, Christ in the grave, the resurrection and Pentecost were a fulfillment or the fulfillment of that shadow which came to be nailed at the cross. The Old Testament were a shadow of things to come. The New Testament are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There were three other festivals which were left. Trumpets, Atonement and the Tabernacle. We'll be discussing those in a bit more depth in a, diff in a later lecture. But Trumpets was, is an indication pointing towards also fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But just not at that time. Trumpets points towards the second Advent movement. The atonement refers to the pre-advent judgment which takes place after 1844 and the tabernacle which was Tishri 15 points towards the home going or the second advent of Christ. These are, this is the day that we're waiting for. This is the final fulfillment of all of these types are going to be fulfilled in the anti-type and the Old Testament will then truly become the fulfillment of the New Testament. Just as in the Old Testament things were a shadow, the, the information there, this tabernacle was a shadow of things to come, in the New Testament everything is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So if the New Testament gospel 
is the same as the Old Testament gospel, then what changed? Well, we discussed it just now. We talked about that ceremonial law outside the Ark of the Covenant. And we spoke also about the veil between the holy and the most holy. If you entered into the, holy, uh, into the most holy place, you would die. The Shekinah glory would overpower you. You would, wouldn't be able to stand in the brightness. Well, what happened at Jesus' crucifixion is the ceremonial law came to an end. As the Passover lamb was about to be crucified, it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why the earthquake took place. The sanctuary was split in half. And the veil was rent in two, was torn. Mark 15 verse 38 tells us that this massive curtain, six meters high, as thick as a brick, as thick as a man's hand, was torn how? From top to bottom. Now, I'm tall. I'm almost two meters tall. But I wouldn't be able to turn to tear a six meter curtain that's as thick as my hand. Only one person in the universe could have done that, and that would have been God. So the Lord is telling us here that through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ with the tearing open of the curtain, we can now see straight into the Holy of Holies, which was never done before. Prior to that, we had to sacrifice lambs. We had to go through a certain ceremonial process. But from then onwards, Hebrews 4 verse 16 makes sense. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. From then onwards, you can approach the throne of grace directly. The most wonderful promise. You no longer have to fear the Shekinah glory. You no longer have to worry about having to go through the ceremonies. You can approach the Ark of the Covenant, the Shekinah glory, the throne of God, the mercy seat, all at the same time directly because the entire ceremonial system had come to an end. What we know of is in the sanctuary in the Old Testament had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. That's why John, verse, John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wonderful truth. Wonderful, wonderful truth. In Matthew five seventeen to 18, the true explanation of this comes to light in the New Testament. Matthew five seventeen to 18 explains this even better. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So you have a certain ideology or certain thinking in Christianity today that says, no, but the law's been done away with. We are no longer under the law. We are under grace. But the Lord says, I've not come to remove it. I've not come to destroy it. I've come to fulfill it. I've come to live it out to its fullest potential. And the understanding of we are no longer under the law is a confusion of the moral law versus the ceremonial law. The earthly sanctuary represented also the heavenly sanctuary. Not only did the festivals in the sanctuary have to represent certain things on earth, but in Hebrews 4 verse 14 it tells us of the earthly tabernacle or sanctuary representing a similar one in heaven. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. So where the priest on earth represented the one who would carry our sins into the temple. So Jesus Christ in a temple sanctuary in heaven is the high priest that is passed into heaven, Jesus the Son of God. Read with me Hebrews 8 verse 1 and 2. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Let's paraphrase this a bit. Let me read it again. We have such a high priest, right? Like the one on earth, we have a high priest, but he is now in heaven. A minister of the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Which uh, power pitched the tabernacle on earth? Man or God? Well, Moses pitched it, so it would have been pitched by man. 
So here's another tabernacle, and it says in heaven, which is not touched by man, this has been pitched by the Lord. So the one on earth actually represents the sanctuary in heaven. The sanctuary shows us, the, the Old Testament sanctuary, shows us that the gospel we have today is the same as the gospel we had in the Old Testament. It was designed to help the people of the Old Testament understand God's plan of salvation. Today we read about Jesus Christ and understand that through Jesus Christ we can attain salvation. In the Old Testament sanctuary, they had the same gospel, but just laid out in a different marketing plan, if you will. Okay, so if this is the case, then what about the Ten Commandments? Are we still bound by God's moral law? Let's look for a moment at the character of Christ versus the character of his moral law. Let's look into the word and bring up a list of, of items that identify, according to the text words, what are the true characters of God himself. Well, according to Romans 3.26, the character of God is just. According to John 3.33, the character of God is truth or true. 1 John 3.3 3 says that ca God's character is pure, 1 John 1 5 says it is light. Going through the rest of the scriptures, you've got God is faithful, God is good, God is spiritual, God is holy, God is truth, God is life, God is righteousness, perfect and forever, eternal. So let's weigh that up. Those are the characteristics which make up God. Who, what is his character? Let's look at what the Bible describes throughout as a theme study, throughout the word, what is the character of the law? Incredibly enough, 100% alignment with the true word of God. The character of God is the same as the character of the law. According to Romans 7 verse 2, the character of the law is just. According to Nehemiah 9.13, the character of the law is true. Psalms 19 verse 7 and 8 says that the character of the law is pure. Going through the rest of the scriptures, it says that the character of the law is light, is faithful, is good, spiritual, holy, truth, life, righteousness, perfect and forever. Isn't that incredible? When it comes to the moral law, the character of God is fulfilled in the moral law or the character of the moral law is fulfilled in Christ. That's why he says, I've not come to take the law away, to destroy the law of the prophets. I've come to live it out to its fullest potential. 1 John 3 verse 4 says, for, the, for sin is a transgression of the law. So if sin is a transgression of the law, if that's the definition, is this now the moral law or the ceremonial law? Remember, we're in the New Testament, 1 John 3 verse 4, for sin is the transgression of the law. Moral law or ceremonial law? Well, James 2 verse 11 says something quite phenomenal. For he that said, do not commit adultery, Question, moral law or ceremonial law? As far as I know, the moral law speaks about do not commit adultery. Let's continue, James 2.11. For he that said do not commit adultery said also do not kill. That's also in the moral law. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Isn't that amazing? Here in the New Testament in James, right at the end of the Bible, the same thing is said. The speaking, reiterating, thou shalt not kill, reiterating, thou shalt not commit adultery, and saying, if you do this, you're in, in, in the, you are a transgressor of the law. If we were still under the ceremonial law, we would have to, have to do some pretty strange things. We'd have to kill all the homosexuals, because that would just be, according to Leviticus, something we would have to do. We would have to slaughter a lamb for forgiveness, which we also don't do. And we would have to keep the festivals of the Old Testament. So we are no longer under the ceremonial law, but we are under grace, the character, the true fulfillment of the law in Jesus Christ. And I often get asked, are the Ten Commandments in the New Testament? Well, do yourself a study and have a look at it. I just put it up on a graphic that you can see Old Testament versus New Testament. The first commandment, you can see it in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. It is repeated in the New Testament, Matthew 4 and Mark 12. Second commandment is repeated in Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and Revelations. The third commandment, Matthew 5, Matthew 15, Matthew 23, and Mark 7. What about the fourth commandment? Keep the Sabbath day. Genesis 2 in the Old Testament. Exodus, 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 Leviticus 19, Leviticus 23, and Deuteronomy 5 again. 
These are repeated over and over and over in the New Testament. Matthew 12, Matthew 12 again, Matthew 24, Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, and on and on and on. What about the fifth commandment? Well, you can read it in Matthew 15, verses 4 to 9, Matthew 19, 18 and 19, Mark 7, verse 9 to 13, Mark 10, 19, and Luke 18, 20. The sixth commandment is available in the New Testament, Matthew 5 and onwards. The seventh commandment, the same. The eighth commandment, the same. The ninth commandment and the tenth commandment you can find in Matthew 15, 19 and 20 and Mark 7, verses 21 to 23. So I ask you, is the, is the moral law still available in the New Testament, yes or no? Absolutely. Romans 2.13 even says it. It says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Those that obey according to the requirements of God's character which are fulfilled in the law. You see, one of Satan's most successful and devious deceptions is to make humanity believe that the Ten Commandments no longer exist. This is one of the most potent lies in all, in, in, in all history. It's a terrible thing because what it does is it, it allows you to forget what eternity is going to be like. Do you think there's going to be murder in heaven? Is there going to be adultery in heaven? Am I going to be able to have to worry or will I have to worry about my stuff being stolen in heaven? No. The truth is that the law will be maintained throughout eternity. It's down here that it's not. In heaven, there's going to be no more murder. There's going to be no more theft. There's going to be no more lying. There's going to be no more adultery. And you'll be able to speak to Jesus face to face. Imagine that. Just as the commandments reflect the true character of God, the commandments should reflect our character as well. And in summary, I'd like to close off this this lecture by beginning again. We challenged God with one of the most important questions we can ever ask. Who are you? Tell us who you are. Is it Jesus? Is it Brahma? Is it Buddha? Is it Shiva? We've identified that God is Jesus Christ. We had three options given to us. Prophecy, time prophecy, and science. No other God in the universe is able to compete with that. By identifying himself as God and living outside the timeline, he then says, right, I've now ha been able to prove who I am. I'll show you that I institute a system in the Old Testament that allows you to understand how I'm going to save your souls. It's called the sanctuary. And that system will be a shadow of things to come that when I am nailed to the cross, they will be fulfilled in my character. Certain of the festivals will fall away, but the character of the moral law, which is the character of God, one and the same thing will stand forever. The Ten Commandments, the moral law, is therefore binding today as it ever was. And it's going to be binding into eternity. We won't be able to kill each other in eternity. And that's part of the moral law. I hope that there's something inside this discussion that we've had today that will lead you into an even closer relationship with our Christ, and our, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one true God, Jesus Christ. There is only one name under heaven by which man can be saved, and that is the name Christ Jesus. Being God, living outside of the timeline, He gives us prophecy and He shows us what is going to happen in the future. In order to understand the end time, we need to look into the prophets and what they've written and see whether we can somehow decipher what the future is going to entail for us. I urge you to come back for the next lecture when we're going to be looking into the structure of prophecy how to read it, how to understand it, and how to figure out whether those stars coming from heaven are nuclear bombs or what are they. We'll let the Bible unlock the Bible in the next lecture. Thank you.